on down the highway, you've seen these signs as you're looking for a place to exit. You've seen these signs as you're trying to cross the highway. They're right across the road in front of you. As a matter of fact, the, the sign is, especially like on a one-way street as well, uh, if you're going against that traffic on a one-way street, it says, Do not enter. Here's your sign. Here's your sign. Do not enter enter now somebody tell me what that means don't go that way it's the wrong way it's the wrong way now they tell you this and they put these signs up here to save your life to keep you safe and not only that but if you're the kind of person that does go up those kind of roads They've been put there to keep other people safe from you. But the whole fact of the matter is, it's about not going where you're not supposed to go. Because you either endanger yourself and your life, or you endanger the lives of others. Correct? Now, tell me something. If you violate that law, and just by chance, a law officer is there. He's going to give you a ticket. Now, as I work with many people in society, they're not going to take the blame for doing something like that upon themselves. What are they going to do? They're going to blame the officer. That's exactly right. It was his fault. He shouldn't have given me that ticket for doing something that was going to bring harm to me or harm to someone else. And so, in the beginning of all that, we, we, we start trying to justify our motive, justify our action, justify why we did what we did. There must be a justifiable reason in doing what was wrong. We're going to look for it, aren't we? We're going to try to find it. We're going to search real hard. Well, there is some shocking news. I don't know if you've heard it lately. There's some shocking news about sin. And if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Now, you know how uncomfortable it is for me to sit down and uh, to, to preach the Word of God. Amen? This just isn't right, is it? You're having a good time sitting listening to it, though. Maybe for a little while, anyhow. But there's some shocking news about sin, some shocking news that has come across my desk. And it's amazing to me what we need to know and what has been, is being said. And the, the incredible thing about it is the facts that you're going to hear today. These facts, ladies and gentlemen, are not my facts. These facts are not from me. They're not. They're from, they're from us, a higher source. They're from someone of greater learning and greater understanding, greater wisdom. And, you know, it's just like it would come from the desk of the president down into uh, Congress, of which they bypass that now, right? Amen. And, uh, and, and just go ahead and make it law, which is highly illegal within itself. So we've got a lot of breaking of the law. You know, the law is set forth to condemn men. You know that? And the only way, though, here's what I want us to realize about the law and about God's wisdom, is the law is righteous, and the law is just, the law is pure, and the law is good. The only thing that makes it bad is when we violate it. It's when we go against the righteous law of God. It's no different than the law of man. That's exactly right. When we violate the law of man... It only becomes detrimental to us when we go into breaking that law, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So what does God say? And mind you, in this message today, this is primarily focused at the believer. Although the believer needs to realize, the unbeliever needs to realize this and come to the conclusion, hey, listen, even though I may not be a believer and I'm not breaking God's law because I'm not in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter. God's law is still 
the standard. It is still the right thing. And everyone who breathes and who has been brought into creation will give an account for the breaking of the law of God. Now, those who are believers, you may say, well, I've been saved by grace. Mm. That gets me a get-out-of-jail-free card. That type of mentality leads most believers, most Christians, mind you, leads them to thinking, I can do what I want to, and God's going to forget it, and God's going to forgive it. Let me tell you something. That mentality verifies Ladies and gentlemen, it verifies that you're not a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. If that is what you want to do is justify your sin by breaking the law of God because you think, well, I've got a great attorney. Jesus Christ is my advocate. I'm going to get out of jail free because Jesus is standing there as my attorney giving an account for me saying, oh, you can't blame that on them because I died for them. Your whole, your whole perspective on your salvation is skewed. And it's wrong. It's a salvation that you have conjured. You see, when God chooses to call you, and as a genuine believer, you come into Him, you embrace His righteousness. And you embrace His law. You embrace His law. Let's see what the writer in 1 Corinthians, who was inspired by Almighty God, has to say about this fact and has to say about this. In 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. A fatal mistake has been made, ladies and gentlemen. It's been made by many in society. It is the deceptive mindset that God accepts those who indulge in the depravity of sins that stimulate the flesh. Oh, this is just the sins of the flesh that we're dealing with here. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. What I want you to realize today, ladies and gentlemen, is that just one of these sins leads to many others. The depravity goes deeper and the defilement goes much wider as we stimulate the flesh. Because it is natural to us. Because it meets the needs of our natural man. We feel it's not wrong. Because it's so natural. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to be deceived today. God does not accept unrighteous behavior. And listen close, believer. And listen close, unbeliever. Because too many people, including Christians, are being deceived about the grace of God. They're living lives of fleshly indulgence and feel that it is acceptable because of God's grace. This, my friends, is a false and fatal mistake. Grace is not a license for you to do that which is wrong. We're about to go into the lifestyles of sinful behavior. And we're just going to hit the tip of the iceberg today. But some of these things are going to shock you. Do you know why they're going to shock you? Ladies and gentlemen, they're going to shock you because you're involved. And you're indulging. And not just you, but everyone in this room. Including the newscaster today. How many of you have ever wanted just to hear the preacher say that? Say that you sin, preacher. Just say that. Just one time, say that you sin. Oh, yes. The Scripture tells us, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all done that. We've all made mistakes. But the great, great thing is, is we don't have to remain there. You see, sinful behavior that too many Christians are involved in are things like we're about to list today. And these things, like I said, they may very well shock you. Things like, as he mentioned here in 1 Corinthians, fornication. Oh, what is fornication? What is the definition of fornication? It is all forms of sexual and immoral acts. Things like 
premarital sex outside of marriage, adultery, abnormal sex, or the use of sexual vices. And there are so many things, and it is so deep how this goes. And we need to realize today, and some people may be sitting out there and say, well, listen, this is, this is a little too risque for a preached message. I wanted to tell you something. There is a reason that a lot of pastors are having to teach now as they preach. They can't really just preach the hard word. And the reason they can't preach the hard word is they're having to teach those who aren't giving themselves opportunities to be taught. So we've got to break it down just a little bit farther. The message has got, has got to be just a little bit smoother. The news to you has just got to be a little more subtle, and we've got to come from a different angle to try to entertain you, capture your attention, ladies and gentlemen, and keep you zeroed in on the message because you're not allowing yourself the opportunity to know the whole news and nothing but the news as... What was his name, he said. And now the rest of the story, Paul Harvey used to say. I miss Paul Harvey. He was good. He was good. But as we're talking about and what Scripture points out, here's the facts, ladies and gentlemen. In Galatians 5, verses 19 and 21, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, envy, murder, and drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fornication and lasciviousness, they go hand in hand. Lasciviousness goes so deep. It is the self-indulgent passions that lead to all types of perversion. We could sit here and go on and on and on about this. But the greatest device and the greatest tool that is leading more and more people astray is the Internet. So much access to fleshly thoughts and fleshly indulgences that lead to behavior of the mind and such godly acts. So such terrible things are going on in the minds of men. Christians who in their privacy, no one's watching. I'm going there. I just got to see. I just want to know. And there is the deception. There is the trap that Satan says, okay, look, it, it isn't going to hurt you just to type that in. It isn't going to hurt you just to say, and then you can turn it off. You're not going to turn that off. The excuse of this feels good to my flesh. And this fulfills my own passions and desires. Leads me to do so. And therefore it goes into so many different areas. Of wickedness and perversions. That the next thing you know. We're caught. The next thing you know. We're arrested. And we never ever knew how we got there. We're dabbling. We're playing in sin. And it's serious. Very serious stuff. It leads us even into farther and deeper things, such as idolatry. Now, a lot of people would think that this is just the worship of some kind of stone, metal, wood uh, idol that you set up on your desk, like a little Buddha at the China store. You know, everybody go by the China shop and buy a little Buddha. Put it in your gardens out there in the yard. You know what I mean? Oh, I don't worship it. It's just cute. I like the fat little guy, you know. Looks good sitting there. It goes much farther than that. You see, idolatry is a sin of the mind and the body against God. Any idea that is contrary to Christ and who He is in Scripture is the worship of an idol in one's mind. Take, for instance, let me tell you, we had some alarming news Wednesday night that they are teaching the religion of Islam in the schools. Absolutely. Now, I realize they take this as, this is part of social studies. Understanding other religions, that's idolatry. Do you realize there are Christians who are more indulged in looking into the beliefs of other religions than they are indulging themselves in their own understanding of what they're supposed to believe? Because they're intrigued. Oh, this, this is interesting. This is interesting. Well, you know, the Bible, we've got it. I mean, for heaven's sakes, 
Look how much I read that thing. <coughs> I'm really into it. But other things that intrigue us. We sat there with our... We're, we're, you took your iPad with you, didn't you? You got it with you. I was going to play with it. We get to take the iPad and, I mean, just for hours on hours, we're scrolling the iPad. Do you realize that's idolatry? Think of the hours that are spent scrolling and researching. It's taking precedent in your life. Yeah, well, listen, I want you to understand that I'm very specific about who my friends are. I'm very specific. And, and, and it, who I allow to, to be on my, my, my friend's book. And this, I don't know what I'm talking about as far as all that stuff because I don't have one of the confounded things. I honestly believe it, is, it has been one of the worst tools that Satan, or in his case, the best tool that he's ever used to captivate the minds of Christians and lead them astray and is doing so and we're caught up in the idolatry we worship it it consumes us it takes precedence in our life it consumes our mind and I give my mind and I give my body and I give my thoughts and I give my time and I give my energy and I give my efforts and I give my loyalty to something other than God why because it's so intriguing it's so intriguing Oh, I just love to sit and to stroll and to scroll. It's so wonderful. It entertains me. Let me tell you something. Get down in your lowest point of your life, ladies and gentlemen. And you know what you're going to pick up. You're going to pick this up. And you know where you're going to go. Nine chances out of ten. You're going to go to the and the Psalms. Oh, yes, such comforting words in the Psalms. Because we read where David, oh, he was so persecuted. He was so down and he was so out. And he saw where the Lord would lift him up. Oh, I'm going to the Psalms. And once my dilemma is over with, back to the scrolling I go. Back to my idolatry. Romans 1, verses 22 and 25 says, Professing to be wise, they became fools who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And worshiped and served the cre creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Idolatry, ladies and gentlemen, is the failure to look up to God and acknowledge Him. The failure to give one's life to Him, including one's thoughts, including one's time, including one's energy and efforts, including your loyalty and your worship. Oh, well, okay, now you can get off of that subject. That's, that's pretty shocking. That's pretty shocking. Now, why don't you just move on to the next subject? We've got very little time and so much ground to cover. Well, how about adultery? How about adultery? Adulterers. What, what are adulterers? Explain that to me. Well, you just said they were fornicators. Oh, it goes much deeper, ladies and gentlemen. The shocking news about it. Those who are sexually unfaithful to their spouse. Those who look upon the opposite sex to lust after them. Imagining and lusting. Where's my sunglasses? At the opposite sex. In person. Oh, not just in person, ladies and gentlemen, but in magazines. In books. Online. And this is why, guys, ladies, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm going to let you in on this. So, you, so when you go to the beach with your husband, there's a reason he wears sunglasses that go from the center of his face to his ears. That is so he could sit on the beach like this right here, and those eyes can go almost behind his head to see the young lady as she continues to walk by. Peering, peering. Oh, you may say, listen, let me tell you something. I haven't done anything with her. I just looked. Now, that's part of God's creation. Preacher, newscaster, it's part of God's creation. If God did not want me to look at it, He would not have made it. So that is why. That is why I look. Imagining, lusting in the heart, in the mind is the same as committing the act of adultery. This is God's 
word. This is God's righteous law. And for you to try to justify that is a violation of that law. You know, it would be amazing. Wouldn't it be amazing? Because everything is done by computer today. Everybody's uh, finances are done, you know, by computer. If God could find you every time you lusted after someone else, wouldn't that be amazing? How bankrupt would every one of us be? We'd all be bankrupt, wouldn't we? Absolutely. It wouldn't take long. Not very long at all. You wouldn't even have to wait to get your bank statement to find out you were bankrupt. The bank would call you and tell you you were bankrupt. We've got a problem. Matthew 14, verse 28. God says this. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So deceitful is the concept that just looking isn't wrong. You say to yourself, well, that's just eye candy. Well, I know that I can look, but I just can't touch. We will find any justifiable reason to indulge in the sinful act of the flesh because it is and feels so natural to us. Wrong is wrong. Sin is is sin and it is time that God's people paid attention aren't you glad you aren't a Christian because none of this applies to you does it wrong wrong we were talking about this in Sunday school today or in the conference room as we want to call it today since we're making a newscast today we're in the conference room in the back and we were discussing the plans for today's message in today's service, how God was going to go and how He was going to move. And it's amazing what God compiles, the news He puts together to prepare the hearts and minds to receive the Word of God. Whether you're a believer or a non-believer today sitting out there in this audience, understand this, this Word's for you. Not this bud. No, no, no. We're going to get to the bud in just a minute. This Word's for you. Yes. Well, we can go on to more degrading things. There's got to be worse than news in it. We thrive on worse news, don't we? We love bad news. Ah, oh, man. Give me the juicy stuff. Come on, join with me. Give me the juicy stuff. Give me the juicy stuff. Come on, give me the juicy stuff. We want the bad, man. Let me hear it. That's the reason the first thing that we do after we take that first sip of coffee is we turn it on, baby. i got to find out what horrific thing has happened today. Well, here's the big bug. Here's the big bug. Here's the big bug in all Christianity. Homosexuality. Mm, yes, that's the big bug. Now, I want you to realize something. It's listed with the rest of these sins. It applies to the rest of us sinners. Okay, one hearty. It applies to... It's all depraved. It's all wrong. Sin is sin and wrong is wrong. And so it all applies to us. But we have just got to center on this. We need to pound this in the head. We need to condemn all these people to hell. Don't we? Isn't that what the Word says? They're the only ones? No. No, ladies and gentlemen. We know that homosexuality, whether you be lesbian, whether you be a sodomite, is wrong. It's wrong. Absolutely. It is a condemned abuse of one's body with someone of the same sex. This is a sin of total depravity, mind you, that takes its toll on the individual's body and on the individual's soul and on the individual's mind. It brings about disease. It brings about guilt. And have you ever noticed the personality deformities that strike the individual like a scorpion. Let's take, for instance, you've seen it in the news. They're calling it courageous now. 
There was once this guy named Bruce. There was this guy named Bruce. And uh, what is Bruce's name now? Is what? Caitlin. Can you imagine the confusion that is going to occur in heaven when Caitlin stands before Almighty God? And he's going to say, Caitlin, I don't have your name here. Well, I used to be Bruce. There's confusion there. There's confusion here. Why? Why? You see, we don't understand that. We don't understand that. It's confusing to us. And I'll tell you why we don't understand it. Because we may not be in that and indulging in that in body. But you have an enemy. You have an enemy who has caused intrigue to you about it somewhere. It's the depravity of sin. And the intrigue is there. And the thing about it is, is so many are being misled by that. It's being so accepted. He's been called, she's been called, it's been called courageous to do such a thing. We don't understand the madness. We don't understand the sickness. We don't understand the sin. Scripture speaks plainly to it. And it's in more than just one area of Scripture. Now, in Jude's verse 7, it says this, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, have, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example of, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Homosexuality is being passed off as accepted today as some type of sickness and as a legitimate alternative lifestyle, ladies and gentlemen. It is condemned by God, by His Word. It is punishable by sin and death, disease, guilt, shame, just heap. These descriptions are given in Scripture. However, however, listen to this. It is a sin that can be forgiven. It's a sin that can be overcome through repentance. And it can be healed through counseling. Coming to a greater understanding of the purpose for which Christ created you. Forgiveness. And healing. Did you hear me? I have a friend of mine, personal friend of mine. Many years ago, I met him. And when he first came into the town of Childersburg, he was diagnosed with HIV. His diagnosis was not good. He could not find anyone who would cut his hair because of what he was diagnosed with. And so, a gentleman pastor, friend of mine, came to me and began to talk to me about it. Do I condone this lifestyle? Absolutely not. But who am I condemned to condemn? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Is it my place to take the Word of God and explain how they can be forgiven and delivered? Yes, it is. Regardless, it's a dangerous and a depraved lifestyle. But it's one that can be forgiven. So as he came to me and I began to cut his hair, we formed a friendship. You mean you were friends with one of those? Yes, I was. And you know what? He's reformed today. He's forgiven. He's released. He's condemned no more. And moreover, he does not live that life anymore. But it was by forgiveness that he was able to overcome. By forgiveness, he was able to be healed. Well, let's move on. Oh, there's many, many more to go. We've got a lot of ground to cover, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of news left in this day. What about the thief? Well, I don't steal anything. I don't steal anything. You ever lied to someone? <laughs> you stole the truth from them, didn't you? Absolutely. You are a thief. What about the shoplifter? Oh, that's the shoplifter. What about the sneak thief? The one who just picks up stuff, you know? Well, nobody will need that. 
Put it away. You know, children are the biggest sneak thieves in the world. Oh, you wouldn't think that about your angel, would you? Well, it's just laying there. You pick it up, you tote it off. Nobody's using it. Nobody needs it. And it leads to more things. It leads to deeper sin. Now, uh, I'll never forget, I'll never forget when I got caught by my dad. Taking a piece, not just a piece, I took a pack of chewing gum from the grocery store. Winn Dixie, downtown Sylacauga. I was five years old. He took me back to the store and made me stand in front of Jerry Adair. And I'm standing there. And I got to tell Jerry I stole that gum. I'm sorry. I stole the gum. Let me tell you what grace is. Eleven years later, Jerry Adair hired me as a stockman. I'm glad he didn't remember I stole that piece of gum. It was the first job I had that I said I never would take. Stealing. Being a thief. Stealing the truth. Small things. Insignificant. It doesn't mean anything. No one wants it. Taking a valuable because maybe I'm not willing to work and earn things for myself. Taking things from others. You know it's rampant nowadays. If you didn't tie it down, if you didn't locked up, even if it's tied down and locked up, they'll cut the chain, they'll break the door down to get what you have worked for. Doesn't that make you angry? Don't you want them nailed to a cross and hung in the square, middle of the town square? Yes, you do. Ephesians 4.28 says this, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor. Boy, that's a foregone word, isn't it? Working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Stealing, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen is sinful. It's taking from others that which you haven't earned. Can I get an amen? It is the alternative uh, to working is stealing. But the alternative to this lifestyle is becoming productive in providing for your family. It's God honoring through honest, honorable means. You know what? This includes entitlement programs. Oh, yes. I, I thought I'd get a whole lot more than that. Do you realize how many people are stealing from you in this nation? Do you, know, you realize how many people are not willing to work because maybe it's just not what they think they ought to be making? It's amazing to me how much people think they're worth. Especially people with absolutely no training, no knowledge. Well, I'm not going to work for less than $10 an hour. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to take, 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 take until you give me what I want. You're a thief. Well, I'll earn more if I, if I, if I take the entitlement more than I would if I were working. You are lying to yourself. You're being deceived. You will not. Because it will build absolutely no character or quality of life in you. You'll just be a taker and not a giver. So you, my friend, and me as well, if I'm not willing to work, you are a thief. Ow. Oh, you should not say that. You, you, we're in church, for heaven's sakes. You're supposed to build me up. You're supposed to make me feel good. God is good. Amen. And we say what? All the time. God is good. God's good enough to switch your rear end. That's exactly right. To let you know what's going wrong. What you're doing wrong. What you're indulging in. Oh, you've been caught. You've been caught. Let, let this word theft. Let's let it go a little bit further. Let's talk about coveting. Did you know that coveting is theft? You know, coveting is stealing. It's wanting to get from someone else. You ever had this? Uh, you ever had this thought come by your mind when somebody drove by in a real nice, sharp car? Oh, I sure would like to have that car. You know what that leads to? Stealing. If you covet long enough, and you realize, listen, I can't have that fiftieth anniversary Corvette. 
He doesn't need it anyway. So when he goes in the store, because I am so good, I've learned how to do this through the education of the prison system. I have learned how to steal that car in three seconds flat. I think I'll take it. He doesn't need it. It's mine. I'm going to get it. Coveting leads to stealing. They all, they all tie together. Those who want more and more, who are never satisfied, those who spend more wondering about the pleasure and the luxuries of life, who crave possessions, who crave fame and power. Let me ask you that, this question. Are you among those who crave the things of others? Do you crave that? Are you filled? See, this is also going to lead to envy. You're envious of the things that other people have because you don't have those things. You see, in Luke 12, 15, Jesus says this. He says, And He said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. He says, Take heed, beware. It's going to take you farther than you intended to go. And it's going to cost you more than you intended to pay. Those who bank and store up and hoard, ignoring and neglecting the desperate needs of teeming millions of people who are dying of hunger, disease, and poverty and sin, live covetous life. Oh, ladies, I'm sorry, but here it comes. Have you ever heard of couponing? Yes. Oh, I love couponing, Brother Ron. I love couponing. You see, with couponing, most of the time, all I've got to do is go in there and pay the tax. The rest I get for free. There are things in your house that you will never use. But because it was free, and somebody else had it and I didn't, I'm going to get it. Amen? And I'm not just going to get one. We're going to BOGO that thing, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Two for one, we're going to BOGO. And we store up, and we hoard, and we take. Because someone else had it, I saw that I could get it for nothing. And so I coveted that possession, and I took it into my possession, and I stored it in my house, in my cupboard, in my linen closet. So no one else can have it. Amen. Oh, me? Maybe? Oh, yes. I like it when the guys speak up because sin is sin, and I'm going to speak to that sin, and everybody else needs to know it's sin, but you let a woman realize it's sin is... Oh, hear me tell you. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Well, I just don't see it that way, and I'm mad now, and when I go home, I'm going to read on this, and I'm going to prove you wrong, preacher. Go right ahead. Be my guest. I hope it stimulates you. I hope it takes you farther and farther into the guilt and shame and sin that you're already indulging in. I hope that makes you very, very happy. But let's move on, right? Yes, by all means. Let's move to the drunkard. Let's move to the drunkard, the people who use and take alcohol and drugs to affect their senses and lust for pleasure. Those who seek to be tipsy and intoxicated. Those who seek to loosen their moral restraints for the sake of bodily pleasures. Those who drink to relax. Why? Let's, let's get on Christians just a minute. You know, those of you who drink, you know, socially and enjoy that, you know, just, just consider yourself off the hook right now. Let's, let's talk about the Christian. Now, the Christian who loves, to, who loves to go to the next county and buy it and bring it here because you don't want anybody here to know you're drunk. L let's go on into that, okay? And, and let's talk about it. If it is right for you to indulge in it, just think about the simplicity of this, of this question. If it's right for you as a believer to indulge in that, why is he speaking against it here? You know why you like it? Because it fulfills what you want to do. But the law of God says it is wrong. 
I'm not saying it's wrong. God's word says it's wrong. His righteous word has spoken to you. Do not enter. Do not go there. Why? Because, as it says in the book of Proverbs, 20th chapter, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Temperance is the subject with this substance. Temptation with this substance, listen, ladies and gentlemen, is way too high and way too strong for you to be flirting with as a believer. The ability to ruin your testimony and your reputation lies in the participation. Sorry, it'll make you precipitate. Participation of this substance. Let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. What would you think if I was sitting here just sipping on some beer? <laughs> nah. While I was delivering this message. Would that be wrong? Would that be wrong? It's just a substance. It's just a substance. Well, there's nothing wrong with it, Christian. Nothing wrong with it. But you're preaching the Word of God. Listen here, Christian. Every day of your life, you are preaching the Word of God. Every day of your life, you are worshiping Him no matter where you're going. You're either worshiping or you're defaming His name. You make the decision. Now, unbeliever, you may be indulging in this, and I know you enjoy it. You like the way it tastes. Duh. If it tastes like it smells, there ain't no way you enjoy the taste of that. But you probably enjoy that. That substance has never given a testimony that it made my family better. That it made me a better man, a better worker. That it caused me to excel in the business world. Never. But every testimony that I hear about it tells me that it will destroy your life. These are the facts. These are the facts. Something that we don't need to be participating in. Oh, we're almost through with this. Aren't you so glad? We're going to talk about revilers. Those who use abusive, foul language, vulgar language, scolding, rantings, ravings. They are abusive and insolent with cursing and slanderous language. It doesn't just mean, ladies and gentlemen, foul language. It means you tearing somebody down as well. Talking against other people. Last night, I was watching a football game, and I forget what it was, what team it was. They just had one on that flute play that the kicker kicked off. What game was that? Michigan State, yes. And so, I think it was one of the Michigan State players. He said, I don't know what the boop just happened. He said, but I sure do thank God. God is good. Let me tell you something. Those two things do not go together, ladies and gentlemen. But do you realize how many Christians are using your by words? Oh, it's not a bad word to describe things. Well, a joke sure sounds better with one. Mm. In Colossians, the third chapter, verse 8, he says, But now you yourselves are to put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Now understand all these other things derived from filthy language. They're all linked together. They all go together. The rotten, worthless, offensive language of abuses, words only tears down the fabric of other people's lives. They're utterly useless in the building up of others and yourself. Therefore it is spoken that those who use such words. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, this is what the Word of God says. Will not enter the kingdom of God. I didn't say it. God said it. There are those who are here in this room, you're extortioner. What's an extortioner? Those who take money and things by schemes and by force. You know those, those, those title loan places in town? They're extortioners. They're extortioners. And they'll lead you into a trap that you'll never get out of once you start into them. 
and they'll smile at you and they'll offer you all the free pens and coffee cups and everything that you can possibly think of when you come in there. Oh, they're wonderful. They come in there and hand me flowers all the time. Hand me free pens and pads, notepads and stuff like this. Oh, tell everybody about us. I said, okay, I will. I sure will. And when they leave, it goes into file 13. I'm not going to give that to someone. I'm not going to recommend it to someone. Listen, there are those in your family who have taken advantage of you through a loss of a loved one, right? It wasn't bequeathed to them, but they found an angle. You might be one of them to take that which was not properly given to you. Well, they're just ignorant. They wouldn't know what to do with it anyway. Maybe they're just purely innocent. Maybe they're unsuspecting of you. Your family, your friends. I know people that have not spoken to a family member in 20 years because someone took an idol that belonged to Grandnanny and it wasn't supposed to be theirs. It was supposed to be mine. And so unforgiving. You see how far-reaching this is. You see how deep it's going. 1 Thessalonians 4, 6 says this, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified. No matter what anyone says or thinks about this clear indictment of Scripture, whether you do this to persons, whether you practice these sins, understand this, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. But, here's a revolutionary power I have for you today. As we close and wrap up this new session, one that can change all these things is Jesus Christ. It is the power of Jesus Christ that has come to wash away the strain and the stain of sin and flesh, to unloose its chains and its bondage from your life. 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, verse 1 says this Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If you've been justified through Christ, if you're a Christian through the confession of sin and the sanctifi sanctification of His salvation, you've been justified unto His righteousness. The only way that you're going to be glorified is to put off the old works of the flesh and to be renewed in the Spirit through repentance. And that must happen today. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this news flash. We ask you, Lord God, to begin to prepare our hearts and minds. Lord, to repent before you. Because we realize today how deep we're going. How sinful we are. Where these things that we're doing, Lord, is going to take us to places that we never, ever knew we would go. Help us examine today.